This evening on The Rock Newman Show, Shamari Wills discusses his new book, Black Fortunes, the story of the first six African Americans who escaped slavery and became millionaires, from the largest landowner in Tennessee to the woman who funded John Brown's raid. Learn about these little known stories of early black success that's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University located in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. Currently, there are approximately 35,000 African American millionaires in the United States. That's only about one-tenth of one-tenth of the population. As hard as it is to make seven figures today, imagine how hard it was right after slavery. Here's a quote from the book. The black elite in their first decades of existence survived assassination attempts, lynchings, frivolous lawsuits, and criminal cases all meant to destroy or delegitimize their wealth. Joining me now is author Shamari Wills. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me, Rock. I was just telling you this is a bucket list item for me as a D.C. native. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 you're too kind. Uh, you mentioned you're a D.C. native. Um, you uh, went to that other school, uh, <laughs> Morehouse. <laughs> uh, you went there for undergrad. You got your graduate degree, a master's in journalism from Columbia University. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. And I want to jump right into this, man. <laughs> You've done something. I, I, it sounds like I almost say it too often that we start this show by saying that we hope to inspire our audience with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. And I think we, we try to honor that. So we've had some great folks here and some people who talked about great folks and have indeed been inspiration. But you've written a book about the impossible, about folks who are were either slaves or one step removed from slavery, who against all imaginable odds became millionaires. So thank you for the work, number one. Uh, you, part of your inspiration was your, uh, was a gentleman by the name of John Mott, Mott Drew. Tell us why he was, who he was and why he was your inspiration. Well, thanks. First of all, for the kind words about the book, Rock, I, I really appreciate that. So John Mott Drew was my great, great uncle, my great, great grandfather's brother. Um, he was one of the first black millionaires in the Philadelphia area. He started uh, the, one of the first black bus lines in the United States. Now, and he wasn't a slave, but his dad was a his slave. His dad was a slave. Mm -hmm. My great, great, great grandfather, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte Drew, um, he was a uh, former slave from mm. Powhatan, Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, who after he got free right after the Civil War, uh, became the first black man to own property. Uh, and so Napoleon, uh, at some point- well, Hold on now, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let, let, let's stop, because you know, you've lived with this book now for right. a long, long time, so you just rattle this stuff all rolls off your tongue. But John Mott Drew, first African-American, first black man in the United States, to own property. Not John Mott Drew. Um, oh, his, Napoleon. His, da his dad his was dad. the first black man to own property in Powhatan, Virginia. Okay. You know, okay. not too far from here. Okay. okay. Um, so he eventually sold that land, mm -hmm. gave the money to his sons, one of whom was my grandfather, Simon. Right. The other was his brother, John Mott Drew. Uh -huh. They both went into business and were successful, but John was uber successful. Uh -huh. He started a bus line to help blacks in the Philadelphia suburbs. Right. 
uh, get to work in Philadelphia. Uh -huh. uh, and he eventually sold that to what became SEPTA, the main transportation um, hub in the Philadelphia area. Right. He took uh, some of uh, his money, he took the proceeds, he put that in the stock market. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in the 1920s, as the stock market was going up, 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 yes. he pulled it out right in 1929, yeah. uh, right before the big crash when the stock market was, you know, at its peak, uh -huh. uh, and walked away with almost a, a million dollars. Yeah. So he invested, 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 and, and literally, I think we were reading, right, it was a month or so, a, a couple of months or so before the stock market crashed. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't wasn't that close. It was about, you know, it was about uh, five or six months before it crashed, uh -huh. you know, so he uh -huh. didn't cut it too close. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he knew something was coming. Let me just ask, and I don't know if you know this, but was there, did you find out anything? One of the, one of the difficulties that you had is not, a, not, not a, it's, it's not a lot of written records, but did you hear anything about what it was that, made him make that incredible move because that's what that was it was mm -hmm. it was beyond incredible in terms of the timing yeah so i think the thing that was always said about him and his brother and his father mm -hmm. they just had an innate sense of self-confidence they just were born with self-confidence i mean just their you know uh, their names mm -hmm. you know napoleon you know calling himself napoleon bonaparte drew yeah. uh you know, these were folks who just innately had a sense of uh, that they could achieve something great. Uh, and so, yeah. you know, they took these risks that weren't, you know, certainly weren't normal yeah. uh, and were able to really benefit from it. Okay. And coming back to John Mott Drew, uh, your, your great, great uncle. So tell us about that inspiration, how, how he inspired you. What about him and what he did inspired you to sort of seek this kind of knowledge? Well, so the awareness was always there. I always knew about John Mont Drew. Uh, what he was famous for in my family is owning a baseball team. He owned the uh, Philadelphia local baseball team, the uh, Hildell Daisies. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that was always bandied about in the family is a story my mother loved to tell. Mm -hmm. um, I'm descended from him through my mother. Um, so we always knew about him, that he did these great things, but the actual dollar amounts, that was never really talked about, right. uh, how much money he had. Everybody knew he had money. As I started working on this book, uh, you know, you know, specifically my aunt, different people from my family got in contact with me and said, you got to write about Uncle Johnny, you know, he's a millionaire, yeah. you know, and the light bulb went off, yeah. you know, and so that just sort of became an extra source of fuel to, uh, you know, to write the book and to get it finished. And so talk to us a little bit about what your struggles were in terms of not necessarily there being an abundance of records. So, you know, there's a disparity uh, in terms of just vital records between African Americans and white Americans, uh, specifically because, you know, in the, for the antebellum period, uh, black folks were not tracked in the census. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times births, marriages, deaths were not recorded. Right. So, you know, once you get further back than about 1865, the records sort of go away. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that because these folks are hidden a lot of times yeah. and they're not valued uh, in the same way, you know, a lot of our white American heroes are valued, mm -hmm. the records are not necessarily prioritized. Uh, you know, to be kept neatly in an archive where they're really accessible. Mm -hmm. So I had to go all over the place looking for this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just that those were the main two challenges, you know, in getting the information for the book. Okay, so let's start talking about some of the folks. And let's start first with Annie Malone. Tell us all about Annie Malone. So Annie Malone, um, a lot of people would argue that she is the mother of black hair. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know about Madam C.J. Walker. Yes. Uh, but before Madam C.J. Walker, there was a, a woman named Annie Malone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she was an orphan born just after the end of the Civil War to, a, uh, to two slaves, uh -huh. one of whom was a Civil War veteran. Mm -hmm. um, and she grew up in Illinois uh, and became really interested in hair, you know, styling hair, braiding hair. And she noticed as a girl in Illinois, right after, you know, the slave period, that black women were having terrible, you know, trouble with their hair, you know, because we, you know, didn't have good hair products for African-American women right after slavery. Uh, I'm glad you expanded on that, that instead of saying <laughs> she didn't have good hair or black women didn't have good hair. Oh, no, no, I'm, no, <laughs> no, 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 I, 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 I you, you know, I, that's, Bad a, joke. That, that's a, <laughs> that's a huge issue, you yeah. know, that, you know, you know, dealing with that misconception. Sure. But so we didn't have 
you know, really great hair products. People were using uh, animal fats, duck mm. fat, mm. goose fat, bear, bear fat, which is not sanitary. Yeah. And it's a very heavy oil that clogs your pores, can make you yeah. go bald. Yeah. Uh, and they were using these really strong lye soaps to, you know, kind of straighten the hair a little bit. Yeah. And so what you had was really an epidemic of baldness in the African-American community with women. Uh -huh. You know, so she you know, was troubled by this to yeah. see black women using these products that really were not good for them. And she tried to come up with uh, some better products. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she did, you know, she came up with a balm called uh, uh, the Wonderful Hair Grower mm -hmm. to help women, you know, sort of cure the baldness that they were dealing with mm -hmm. uh, from these products. And then she came up with a hair care regimen uh, for black women to take care of their natural hair. Uh, and she built a company, she built a, you know. Hey, before telling us about the, her building the company, do you, do, are you familiar with her educational background at all? Because, I mean, I, I hear you say she was reared by slaves. So, you know, she um, she got to about, you know, what would be middle school today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before she dropped out. So she did have some schooling. Uh -huh. uh, but she grew up in a poor uh, community in Illinois uh -huh. where most of the African-Americans were either sharecroppers or domestics. Uh -huh. So eventually she had to drop out of school to work to help contribute to the household. Uh -huh. uh, but even as she was doing that, she was still learning about hair, developing these product products. And then by the, when she got to be about 30, you know, she, uh, you know, she launched a company mm -hmm. um, and, you know, started marketing these products, you know, to African-Americans. So this would have been right around 1901, 1902, somewhere thereabouts. Right, right. So she, her coming out was really the, uh, the uh, World Fair. Uh -huh. um, in uh, St. Louis is 1904, 1905. Yeah. Um, you know, which is just this big thing. They, uh -huh. uh, you know, you know, built this huge, you know, staging area with, right. you know, rides and presentations uh -huh. and all this, you know, sort of stuff. It was a huge, huge spectacle. Uh, and so she moved to St. Louis actually in anticipation for the fair and, you know, set up her company there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then she just went around and she, you know, just talked to you know, African-Americans introduced them to her products. She yeah. recruited workers yeah. at the World's Fair because there were African-Americans coming from all over the country yeah. to see the World's Fair. Sure. And so that was really her coming out. Uh, and after that, she really launched her company as a really, really big hair care product company. Yeah. You know, one has to ask, just, just where in the world did the vision come from? You know what I mean? It, 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 to me, all of these giants, these 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 rainmakers, these earth shakers, mm -hmm. it's just like man, it's 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 difficult to imagine out of the depths of poverty and deprivation and denigration of who these individuals were, singularly and as a people, how one rises, what it is that one is so blessed to be able to rise, like she did, especially a woman. Mm -hmm. during that time. Right, right. I think it, it, they, one of the things I noticed in all of the characters is just that innate sense of self-confidence yeah. that, you know, superseded, you know, uh, the, you know, negative racist ideas that were out there about black people that yeah. superseded, <coughs> you know, folks only seeing poverty uh, and lack in their immediate surroundings. Yeah. She, uh, I write about a little bit in the book, how she was discouraged by everyone around her to try to build a hair business mm -hmm. to say that that'll never work. Mm -hmm. Black hair will never be a big business, mm -hmm. but she kept going. You yeah. know, she just had they this They kept innate, telling Annie Malone, no way. Yeah, the black folks around her, her yeah. sister, her yeah. friends, they said, hey, this isn't gonna work. Yeah. Black hair will never be a big thing. Yeah. You know, this is a waste of time for you to do this, but she, yeah. kept, she kept going. Well, I'll tell you what, let, let's connect this. It's just further down here on the list, <laughs> but uh, during that time, um, it was not beyond some pretty serious competition in the black community because to a certain extent, we, we know so very much about Madam C.J. Walker, mm -hmm. less about Annie Malone. Right. They were rivals of sorts, right. certainly competitors. Yes, yeah, certainly competitors, <laughs> certainly, yeah. you know, certainly competitors. That's a, that's a, a great way to put it. So uh, Madam C.J. Walker, her name was it's actually Sarah Breedlove. Most people know her as Madam C.J. Walker. Mm -hmm. She worked for Annie Malone. That's mm -hmm. how she got her start. She was a laundress in St. Louis you know, working, you know, this job didn't play a lot of money. It was sure. a very, very difficult job. Sure. And she got a job working for Annie. 
selling her products. Mm -hmm. um, after about a year, she moved to Colorado to sell Annie's products there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, shortly after that, her boyfriend uh, at the time, uh, CJ Walker, moved down to Colorado with her. Okay. And he said, you know what? You should sell your own products. Mm -hmm. And so she started selling basically, you know, for products with the same formulas, same sort of branding yeah. as Annie Malone's products and launched her uh, product line that well, th that way. Now, I mean, it's, you know, one of the things that I really tried to suss out in the book that was difficult was to determine how they felt about each other. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was never an ugly rivalry where, you know, I don't think Annie was really incredibly mad at her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, you know, were at the same events, you know, a lot of times. Right. But Annie Malone was the person that actually gave Madam C.J. Walker her start. Uh, and her business was actually much, much bigger than Madam C.J. Walker's. Uh -huh. Now, she died without any children mm -hmm. to tell her story. Right. And the documents were not really well preserved and, you know, you know, archived in the right way. Mm -hmm. So most folks don't know about her the way they know about C.J. Mm -hmm. Walker. To Two early, two early giants of the female persuasion. Absolutely. Again, man, which as we look back now and, you know, if, if we can frame this discussion as to where we are here today, because we, we, we talk about our maladies, we talk about our issues, we talk about the limitations that right. are put. But when folks understand history, and what these giants did, how they made a way out of absolutely no way, then what is our potential today? And I mean, I, again, I think that this book, Black Fortunes, is so much more than just talking about the stories of these six women. It is something that gives a perspective, you know, and I'll use the trite saying, where, there, where there's a will, there's a way, mm -hmm. because that's what they had. Right. They had they they had to will to overcome just odds that were so ultimately stacked against them. Right. Right. I mean, you know, there's so many racist ideas about the limitations of black people. Yeah. You know, on the very extreme, extreme right. Some people say we're genetically limited or right. you know, we're lesser lesser people, you know, this sort of white supremacist argument. Uh, you know, there's some people who would just say, you know what, black people were just a uh, tragic people, yeah. you know, we're, uh, you, you, and lazy. Yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 you know, we're just doomed where there's no, there's no way out. Right. The circumstances are too dire. And you know, what these figures demonstrated to me is that black people have an incredible potential. That's not to minimize the obstacles we have to go through, mm -hmm. which are, you know, you know, more than, you know, almost anyone else on this planet, yeah. you know, has had to go through. Yeah. Um, but our potential is bigger, you know, than the obstacles we have to face. I, I, I really believe that. Let's move to Hannah Elias. Tell us all about Mr. Elias. So Hannah Elias, you know, she's a controversial, controversial. And of course, and of course I said Mr. Yeah, Miss Elias. Miss Elias. Miss Elias. Another one of the early <laughs> female giants. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, she's a controversial figure. Um, so she was um, born in Philadelphia in 1865, right at the end of the, uh, of the Civil War, um, to free black people. Her father was a caterer, and she moved to New York. Now, um, you know, how she got to New York mm -hmm. is a tale. It's probably too long to tell on the show. But she moved to New York where she became the mistress of this rich white man, yeah. uh, this uh, white millionaire. I'll tell you what. You just said something. It probably is too long of a story to tell on the show here. We've got some time and at least let's let's touch on her journey to get to New York. So her journey to get to New York starts um, when uh, her sister got married in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and her father was a caterer, which at the time that was one of the first businesses that black people got involved with. He was a successful entrepreneur. Right. They were black middle class. OK. Um, and he throws her this, you know, grand wedding that all mm. of the black people in Philadelphia wanted to come to and his, you know, beautiful ceremony. And I'm sure the food was delicious. He was sure. a caterer. Um, and, you know, Hannah, she stole a dress mm -hmm. um, to wear to the wedding. Right. Um, which, you know, it's not a good thing, but I mean, yeah. it's not, you know, it's not, you know, a psychopathic thing to do. Uh -huh. um, and she Some was might say that was being resourceful. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll leave it there. But she, <laughs> she was put in a... Um, 
she was put in a, in a pretty serious prison. She was put in Munyamin Singh prison in Philadelphia, which is kind of is, you know, I don't want to say it's a maximum security prison, but yeah. it was a really serious prison. There were men in there. There were murderers in there yeah. for stealing a dress. Yeah. Um, and so this brought great shame to her family. So her father kicked her out of the house when she got out of prison. Right. And so she just kind of bounced around you know, from different men and, you know, poor houses. And she had a baby, which she had to give up at one point. Mm -hmm. And then so she ends up at New York actually working in a brothel mm -hmm. in New York City. Mm -hmm. And so this group of white men come to the brothel, you know, wanting to see some colored girls, yeah. you know, wanting to have whatever, you mm -hmm. know. And, um, you know, one of them, uh, you know, is um, a white millionaire. Right. And, you know, they spend the night together and, you know, they kind of fall in love. Um, and you, you know, remember. You remember. Um, Harlem Nights. Yes. Yes. She was early sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going. That's a good reference. <laughs> Daddy ain't coming home. Let's keep going. <laughs> So um, they fall in love, and he's this guy. Was they, 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 we, we talk about Han Hannah, Hannah Elias. Hannah Elias. Yes. And, and so he just heaps money on her. He gives her about $700,000. And she had Whew. just this incredible mansion uh, right off of Central Park. She had this, you know, incredible troop of servants from everywhere, Senegal, yeah. Paris, yeah. Japan, uh -huh. you know, which we, at the time having foreign servants was a, you know, a, a luxury. An incredible status symbol. Yes, yes. 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 And, and yes. so... Um, she also invested the money in real estate when, you know, when she was with him. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happened is that their affair ended up getting exposed. Right. Um, there was another man, you know, she was very, very, a very popular, popular woman with, the, you, you know, with, with the fellas. Uh -huh. um, you know, another man who was kind of obsessed with her named Cornelius Williams, mm -hmm. he uh, sought to kill her white lover, right? Uh -huh. And he kills another white guy who looks like him, ah. who's the city planner of the New York of New York City. He, you know, sort of built the greater New York City area. Sure. He was instrumental in Central Park, the subway, right. Andrew Green. And so because they looked alike, they were, you know, both white men with beards and dressed mm -hmm. similarly. Mm -hmm. He kills him. Uh -huh. And, you know, that became a, a, a scandal. And so in kind was of the gentleman obsessed with her. Was he white or black? He was black. Uh -huh. He was okay. black. He was obsessed okay. with her. Uh -huh. Um and, you know, so he kills the city planner of New York, thinking yeah. that's her lover. Yeah. And so in sort of the murder trial and the investigation, it comes out that she there's this black woman with all this money having this affair with a white millionaire. Yeah. And there's just a massive public outcry. Yeah. Uh, crowds come to her house, yeah. uh, throw bottles at her windows, throw rocks at her windows. Mm -hmm. And there's this massive public outcry amongst, you know, specifically white folks in New York for her to be put in jail. Mm -hmm. So she's eventually arrested for extortion because, you know, there's no way he could have given the money to her willingly, right? Right. right. Um, you, know, you, have, right. You, you know, you folks just were in disbelief that he could love a black woman that much. Uh -huh. um, and she's put on trial for extortion, you know, and I won't, you know, ruin the ending too much, but she, you know, she eventually gets off because yeah. he refuses to testify against her. Yeah. Um, you know, and she ended up, you know, using her money after that trial mm -hmm. to try to do some things, you know, to help black people or maybe she was just vindictive against white people. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was one of the early investors in Harlem yeah. and helped John Nail, who was really the architect of Harlem, turn it from a white neighborhood uh -huh. because it was an all white neighborhood um, in the early 19 teens. Yeah. He helped. She gave him money and invested with him and helped him flip the neighborhood over into a black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so she's a complicated character. Sure. But sure. I mean, she she uh, she eventually became a millionaire and was, uh, you know, really influential through her role in, um, you know, turning Harlem into the black Mecca. It still mm -hmm. is today. Mm -hmm. So, again, the uh, visionary in, in spite of what some of those challenges were, but there was a socially conscious component that was developed along the way. However, that was done. Right. That would inspire her to indeed get involved in the development of Harlem um, and support causes to advance and to elevate black life in that area. Right, right. And I think her story is interesting because I think she believed at first 
that her money could help her escape her blackness. Yeah. Because she kind of shut herself up in this mansion off of Central Park and never came out. Mm hmm um, and just really, you know, tried to avoid anybody knowing she was black, really tried to avoid experiencing being black. Yeah. She hired doctors and surgeons to try to lighten her skin, yeah. change, her, change her facial features. Uh, she wore wigs of, you know, straight hair. Sure. Um, and didn't like to associate with black people very yeah. much. Um, after she was hauled off to jail, put in the jail in New York City, they called the tombs, yeah. right? Yeah. After she spent a couple nights in the tombs and was put on trial, that kind of changed her mentality slowly mm -hmm. about what it meant to be black. Mm -hmm. um, and she moved away from sort of the self-loathing, um, you know, ideology and moved more towards, you know, wanting to help and wanting to contribute. Hannah Elias, absolutely fascinating. Yeah, she, she is. Yeah. Let's keep going. We've got another lady, Mary Ellen Pleasant. Yeah, Mary Ellen Pleasant, you know, she's, she's just an incredible, incredible, you know, marvel. Um, so she was born free um, in Philadelphia. A lot of these folks trace back to Philadelphia mm -hmm. um, because it was a free place. It was probably the f freest place, you know, during uh, the slave period. But she was born free in Philadelphia in the 1820s um, to a Polynesian merchant and a black woman uh, who was originally from uh, Louisiana. Um, and, you know, she was reared there for her first couple years of life, and then she was eventually sent off to Nantucket, where she was raised by a white family. Right. Um, you know, so she grew up in Nantucket during the whaling boom. Mm -hmm. uh, so she grew up in a boom town, mm -hmm. which was formative for her. Yeah. Um, when she reached adulthood, um, she came into a little bit of money. Uh, she got married, and her husband died and left her some money, about $40,000, $50,000. Uh, so when she got to adulthood, she finds out about the gold rush, another boom, another boom town. And she already had an idea of how to make it in the boom town because mm -hmm. she grew up in one. Mm -hmm. So she becomes a 49er, goes out to the gold rush, um, which was unusual. A lot of African-Americans didn't go and uh, hardly any women went. But yeah. she was a black woman. Yeah. And she went and, you know, was able to build a fortune in California. Are you, can you tell us a little bit about her building that fortune and then what she, what, what she did, the sort of her, some of her times there in California? I, I don't mean to give away, you know, all your book here, <laughs> <laughs> but man, this is some fascinating stuff for our viewers to, to appreciate. Yeah, I mean, I want the stories out there, you know, I want yeah. as many people to know about them as possible. So in California, she was like a lot of the folks, you know, <coughs> Uh, you know, the, you know, the Levi Strausses, yeah. you know, the white folks that went out there and made a lot of money. She didn't go into the hills to mm -hmm. mine for gold. Mm -hmm. She said, hey, there's this market here with the miners. Yeah. Let me try to make some money off of them. Yeah. So she the, she did a couple things. She um, became a money lender, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because the, you know, miners, they always needed money. Sure. You know, they, sure. you know, sometimes they would have a lot of money. Sometimes yeah. they were broke. So mm -hmm. they always needed something. And she lent the money at really, really high interest rates. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's like- You're hard, You were one of their original hard money lenders. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> that, that was one, you know, really good stream of revenue for her. Yeah. Uh, you know, she also got involved in, uh, you know, having laundries, um, you know, washing people's clothes, yeah. having businesses doing that, yeah. uh, you know, where she employed African-Americans, provided sure. jobs for them, sure. which that was a real luxury back then, you yeah. know, when you used to wash clothes with the wash sword and yeah. the wash tub. Yeah. So she had a business doing that uh, she got involved in having boarding houses yeah. she also invested in silver not gold but silver because uh -huh. silver went up during mm -hmm. the gold rush as well mm -hmm. um, you know so she just had her you know she had her hands in everything she could find that was profitable out there yeah um, so I don't know if you were gonna say this or not uh, but I'm so anxious to hear this next phase of her life what was it, uh, she, she's someone that did extraordinarily well. What, how do you draw the connection between that kind of um, wild success at that point, if you will, and her becoming someone who helped fund the efforts of John Brown? So, you know, she grew up in Nantucket, right, yeah. which we think of as a quaint, you know, sort of, you know, Lily White Town, so sure. to speak. 
but during the antebellum period, it was a radical place. Mm -hmm. um, you had black whalers yeah. there. You, a lot of times, black folks were recruited to Nantucket because you know we were thought to have this unnatural strength, yeah. so we could harpoon whales. So there was a lot of black whalers in Nantucket making money, mm -hmm. um, and it was free. And so there was a, a, a you know sort of an, a, a, an oasis of black radical thought. Um, and you know one of the first experiences I describe in the book is how. Frederick Douglass, as a public figure, was sort of born in Nantucket. He gives his huge speech in mm -hmm. Nantucket, uh, which was his first major speech ever. Right. And that kind of launches his entire career. Mm -hmm. And that's just the type of place Nantucket was. It mm -hmm. was a lot of abolitionists, a lot of radical mm -hmm. uh, black abolitionists. So she was reared in an environment where slavery was detested, where fighting slavery was bandied about. And so when she gets to California, um, she resolves to use some of her money that she makes to help black people. Mm -hmm. um, to backtrack a little bit, the other reason she did that is her husband, uh, who was also an abolitionist, mm. that, you know, she married him and he died very shortly after they were married. Mm. But on his deathbed, he made her promise to do something to help African Americans. Mm -hmm. So she had this huge motivation yeah. uh, to do something to fight slavery in the 1850s. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things she decides is, I'm going to go find John Brown. Yeah, because uh, he was constantly in abolitionist newspapers, and she said, "I'm just gonna find John Brown, and I'm gonna give him some money somehow to do something." Yeah. Um, and that leads her to Canada, uh, to Chatham, uh, Chatham, Ontario, uh, where there were a lot of free blacks yeah. who relocated <coughs> to that area after uh, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, and you could catch black people and mm -hmm. put them back into slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and so he came there to meet with these radical black folks in Canada, yeah. she makes it up there uh, to that convention and she meets with John Brown, gives him about $45,000 to fund his raid on Harper's Ferry. You know, I wish my audience all that are watching in here were just kind of all sitting in here because I'd say, hey, let's stop. We can't stop. We're not going <laughs> to stop here on television. I was, but I would be like, stop. Let's ponder that for a moment. Let's ponder, this was what, 18... 1858. This is 1858. Slavery is still the law of the land. Mm -hmm. Got this black lady who left the East Coast, went out to speculate, was a, became a 49er, made a fortune, mm -hmm. and came back across, came back across country, went into Canada, sought out John Brown, and at that time, and I don't know what it equates to now, 1858 to... 20,000 to, to, to 2018, but that $50,000 is probably representative of millions now. Yeah, close to close to a million dollars. Yeah. Okay. And she just when I think about the, the bigness of that, it is something that I just see, man, just looming out there that again, this book is a form of inspiration that should be on everybody's desk. So, you know, that's what I think about your book. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. You know, and I, you know, I, I just, I think Mary Ellen Pleasant is someone who deserves to be honored. Yeah. You know, right up there with the rest of our, our yes, figures. Indeed. Yes, our figures, indeed. You know, because John Brown was instrumental in bringing about an end to slavery, in my opinion. So, you know, it was, a, it was a huge thing for her to do. Yeah. Let's talk about Robert Reed Church. Let's talk about Mr. Church. So, I mean, he's, you know, if I had a favorite character in the book yeah. or a favorite historical figure in the book, it would be Robert Reed Church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he just had such intestinal fortitude. You know, it's, it was unbelievable. So he, he was the son of a rich white man, a steamship owner and his black concubine. Mm -hmm. um, and so he lived with his mother on a cotton plantation until she died. Where? Um, so in Arkansas, mm -hmm. but it was, you know, it was kind of in the area of Bar Arkansas that was bordering uh, Memphis, bordering Tennessee. Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of almost a Memphis suburb, yeah. you know, Memphis, you know, very, very close. So um, when she dies, his father, this white steamship owner, comes and gets him uh, when he's just a boy mm -hmm. and puts him to work, you know, because he belonged to his father yeah. on board his steamship, you know, just working on the steamship. So the steamship industry back then it was two things it was luxury transportation right. you know to get up and down the mississippi mm -hmm. you know get from 
you know, Memphis to New Orleans mm -hmm. or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, but the primary uh, economic, you know, component of owning a steamship was it transported cotton up and down the Mississippi. Right. So it would pick up the po cotton, you know, in Tennessee, uh, you know, this picked in the Mississippi Delta mm -hmm. and usually transport it down to the port of New Orleans where it could be then shipped out internationally, usually to England, you right. know, to fuel their textile industry. Right. So his father was shipping cotton mm -hmm. and he was working on this ship. Mm -hmm. um, so he eventually um, escapes slavery when he reaches adulthood during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, the Confederacy actually commandeered his father's ship. Mm. Um, because when the Confederacy, you know, basically declared war on America, yeah. um, they, they were short on the equipment, yeah. you know, so a lot of Southerners, they went to them and said, you know, we need, you know, what you have. Uh -huh. And so they commandeered his father's ship and he was put to work on board, you know, working for the Confederate sailors. Yeah. Um, and so that ship is actually involved in a huge battle, the Battle of Memphis, in which the Confederacy was beaten very badly. Um, so in the middle of that battle, he kind of jumps off the ship, says, you know, this is it. You know, it jumps off the ship into the Mississippi River. Yeah. Um, this battle occurred just outside Memphis. It's called the Battle of Memphis. Yeah. Swims, swims down river and kind of washes up on the shore of Memphis and builds a life there as a businessman. And it was, you know, he really had to fight to make it there. Um, yes, he had a really interesting life. Why is he your favorite? So I, I think, you know, he, he, the, the strength that he displayed, the fearlessness he displayed um, resonates with me. Mm -hmm. So Robert Reed Church, after he, you know, kind of arrives on Memphis, he, he you know, he starts a business. He starts a pool hall mm -hmm. um, <coughs> in about 1865, 1866. Um, and this was just a place for black people to hang out. A lot of the southern towns after the Civil War were occupied by the Union Army mostly by black soldiers who were there to keep the peace, just basically making sure the Confederate veterans that were there didn't try anything, didn't try to re-enslave the black folks or attack them. Yeah. And so he said, you know, these folks need a place to hang out, have a good time. I'm going to make a pool hall and a bar and a ballroom, basically a nightclub for them. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the most prominent black businesses in Memphis. Um, in 1866, a very bad race riot broke out in Memphis. Uh, you know, in my opinion, one of the worst race riots in history, yeah. where basically these white police officers who were Confederate veterans, most of them, uh, you know, got into a fight with some black Union soldiers, yeah. uh, you know, and basically decided to go on a rampage, just basically killing African-Americans, violating women, uh, you know, attacked a pregnant woman. And so they decided Robert Reed Church, as the most prominent black business owner in, in Memphis, he's got to die, mm -hmm. right? And so... Everybody knew this. Everybody knew they were coming for him this day. This rage, riot raged on for two days. Right. His wife begged him to stay in the house. Mm -hmm. He wanted to stay in the house. He mm -hmm. went to his business and basically waited for them to arrive. Mm -hmm. And so the mob did eventually arrive in his, at his business. They robbed him. They looted him. Uh, they shot him in the head, set his business on fire, and then left him for dead. Um, he actually survived that <laughs> night. Mm -hmm. You know, and after after the uh, race riots incident, he rebuilt bigger, you know, and bought more real estate, bought more property, built more businesses. And he always carried a pistol on his hip mm -hmm. and, you know, he wasn't scared to use it, um, you know. And so he not only fought back through business, but he actually fought back. Uh, there are several instances where he discharged his weapon, <laughs> you know, yeah. in protection yeah. Of, yeah. of him in his own. Mm -hmm. Superhero, man. Yeah, superhero. I think so too. <laughs> I understand. I, I understand why you call him his favorite. It's very difficult. I mean, this is this when you go through this book and you read the different stories and the ba and, 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 and sort of the backstory of the stories. It was very difficult to, to say which one was most inspirational, which one was was most powerful, which one su succeeded against the greatest of of odds. It just I I just repeat. What an incredible example it is for today's time. And I really want to kind of talk to you once we get through this about lessons you learn overall in this research and how they apply to today. Um, before we get there, let's move on down to Jeremiah Hamilton. So Jeremiah Hamilton, he makes a brief cameo in the book. Mm -hmm. um, so he was, you know, basically the only... Uh, black financial broker in New York during the slavery period. 
um, and he was just really a really aggressive trader, um, you know. And he, you know, he was he was um, uh, he was bombastic. He was, yeah. you know, he was a showy person. Mm -hmm. And so he lived in a brownstone, a really nice brownstone in downtown New York, and was married to a white woman who was much much younger than him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he dressed in expensive wool suits. He wore a wig, a flowing black hair. And, you know, he did battle with some of the great white uh, financial titans of, of the air, including the Vanderbilts. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was really, really hated. And so very similar to Bob Church's story, when things went sideways racially, yeah. uh, they came after him. In his case, it was a little early. Earlier, it was during the Civil War, during the Civil War draft riots in New York, when basically, you know, the Lincoln administration said, we're going to have to draft some people for the Union Army to win this war. And basically, you know, a lot of white recent immigrants who didn't feel they had, a, you know, any skin in the game <laughs> in the battle, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, to eliminate slavery, got really upset and they started rioting and killing and crucifying black people. So Jeremiah Hamilton, like Bob Church, is one of the more well-known African-Americans for his business prowess. And, you know, they marched on his house to lynch him. They said they were going to lynch, lynch him by the lamppost outside his house. Yeah. Um, now, he actually heard them coming because, you know, they weren't the brightest lynch mob in the world. They were chanting yeah. and chanting his house number as they marched down the street to come get him. Mm -hmm. And so he fled. You mm -hmm. know, he kind of jumped his fence and ran away. And, you know, they looted his house. They held his wife hostage for a little bit. But ultimately, nobody was hurt. Yeah. Um, you know, but he, you know, was a really cunning investor, a really cunning trader. Um, and, you know, like some of the other folks in this book, you know, he had to you know, fend for his life because of how successful he was. Mm -hmm. O.W. Gurley. So we all know uh, Black Wall Street. Yes. Um, and, you know, you, you bet, it's known as Black Wall Street, but it was actually called Greenwood, and it's part of Tulsa. Mm -hmm. um, and so he built Black Wall Street or Greenwood uh, in, in Tulsa right about at the turn of the century right. when oil was discovered in Tulsa. Um, and it was a boom town mm -hmm. like San Francisco mm -hmm. or Nantucket. Uh, suddenly there was this tremendous need for jobs, for, for domestics, um, you know, for all sorts of workers. And so, you know. Let, let, let me ask you something, because when, when you mentioned, and it's, it's rightly so, he was given so much credit for the building of Black Wall Street, which was there in Tulsa. Um, are you familiar with his background prior to going to Tulsa? Yeah. Yeah. So I so he was from I uh, was from he was actually from Arkansas. Mm -hmm. He was the uh, son of slaves. I think he was born a year after slavery ended mm -hmm. um, And his family. They were farmers, mm -hmm. you know, so he sort of grew up on a farm again, a very ambitious guy. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of always looking for a way uh, you know, to make something of himself. He, the first thing he really did was he became a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is a really good profession. Uh, and then he actually worked for the Postal Service, which, you know, was one of the few government sure. jobs African-Americans sure. could get, Porters, you know, right yeah. after slavery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so he was always looking for opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the, you know he, he, the United States government announced that they were going to open up Oklahoma for settlement, right. which previously had been, you know, you know, the majority of the Native American sure. population was living. Um, and he goes there in 1889, gets a plot of land in that land rush. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it just sort of makes a life there, but he didn't do anything spectacular. Right. Um, and then when there's a second land rush in 1893, no, sorry, sorry, pardon me. Um, when, you know, the um, oil is found, mm -hmm. uh, rather, he sees another opportunity. Right. Um, and so he moves uh, to uh, Tulsa and, you know, he basically started developing the north side of Tulsa, which was completely undeveloped at that time. Mm -hmm. And he developed sp it specifically for black folks and the black folks that were coming there yeah. uh, to work the jobs that were, you know, you know, you know, starting to appear because of the uh, because of the oil boom. Mm -hmm. OK, so uh, like, so that's a good explanation of 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 him uh what he did before getting there and start so do me a favor because inevitably inevitably when you talk about a ow Gurley, 
you have to become maybe more familiar than most with the with the with the terrorizing of uh, Tulsa and Black Wall Street, and it is we hear about that. Mm -hmm. That's famous. Mm -hmm. That that's a famous incident, but there was so much of that prevalent throughout the country. Right. So if you don't mind, you know, kind of for those who might not be so familiar, tell us about. Black Wall Street and its destruction. So the, the Black Wall Street was eventually destroyed again by a race mob. You know, so it's sort of developing a theme of what happens to some of these black folks with money. Um, but it was tragic because it was they called it the Promised Land. It was supposed to be a refuge from that. Uh, it was envisioned by O. W. Gurley and the other you know folks that he built the the, the community with as a place that blacks could come again, come, come and get away from uh, Southern racism. Um, and it was this independent black town. They had their own shops, own doctors, own schools, own lawyers. Uh, they all, you know, either owned their own property or rented from a black landlord. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just really powerful. Um, mm -hmm. And these black folks also, they were pretty heavily armed because it was still the wild, wild west. Yeah. And they were, you know, militant. They really did not uh, stomach a lot of racism um, because, you know, they had, were escaping from it. Mm -hmm. And so for a time, it was just this magical place that African Americans could come, live in their own community, be safe, and make a good living. Yeah. Um, and, you know, eventually, you know, history sort of caught up with them. Um, you know, so in 1921, there was an incident where a black young man, a uh, black boy from Tulsa from Black Wall Street was accused of groping a young white woman. Mm -hmm. um, and it's still not clear whether that actually really happened or not. Um, and, you know, the incident just escalates. He's arrested and put in jail. Um, there's just basically a standoff between armed black people from Tulsa at the jailhouse and armed white folks from Tulsa at the, at the jailhouse. Um, and, you know, it eventually escalates in the violence. And this white mom that was there at the jailhouse, they get in their cars and they basically ride into Black Wall Street, just kill a lot of people, wound dozens of people, and basically bomb it and burn it to the ground. Okay, you, you, you say bomb it. Uh, and I wanna, wanna ask you, you know, which side, of the, uh, which side of the fence you come down on as to looking at it and studying it, uh, clearly there is there are some who say the government was involved in terms of some of the bombs. They weren't just bombs that were thrown by individuals. An organized effort from the government. How do you? Uh, where do you come out on that? Um, that's a difficult question. I mean, the government is certainly culpable. Um, you know, this group of white men that participated, um, they had tried to raid the National Ar Armory before that, so the government certainly knew something was going on. And the government, one thing that we know is that they were there arresting black folks in Tulsa, yeah. uh, supposedly to keep them safe, you know. So mm -hmm. they were arresting them and then moving them somewhere else. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know why you arrest people that are victims of terror. Um, I have no doubt that, the, you know, that you know there was some wrongdoing that happened there. I, I, I you know, I, I don't have the strong evidence of it, but my feeling is that there, there definitely was, a, at very least, severe negligence. Uh, there may have been a conspiracy, you know, but it's, it's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Um, you cannot go through this kind of research to undertake this kind of project find out what you have found out, spend time, you know, examining these heroes and sheroes, and it not change you. In my estimation, that mm -hmm. would be very difficult to do. Let's talk about how this book has changed you and what impact it had, has had on you. Well, I mean, I think obviously, you know, I came away from the book you know, with an even deeper respect, you know, for our ancestors and everything they went through and everything they built. Um, 
uh, you know, I think more acutely, I, you know, my sense of um, wealth and how wealth is built specifically for African Americans um, was enlightened by, by, by this project, seeing actually how folks built it, how they went against the trends and, you know, how they, act, you know, arranged their lives and, you know, what they, they d did with the wealth. Um, you know, so I just think it really changed me in terms of how I think about money and power more so than anything else. Mm -hmm. So, again, from what you have gleaned from all of this work, what becomes your message to your contemporaries, um, the folks that are older than you and the people that are, that, that are younger than you? I, I, I'm curious. Well, so, I mean, this book is an argument um, for hope. Um, you know, the, you know, they endured a lot. You know, you know, some of them, most of them, you know, ended up losing a lot of their money, um, you know, because of the racism that they faced. Um, but I think sometimes we can look at all the racism that goes on still today in America and we can become hopeless. Yeah. We can start to believe that the, you know, racism is a force of gravity that just cannot ever be overcome. Um, and it's very, very serious, but I want people to take away from it that it can't limit us completely, you know, and <coughs> see the strength, you know, that our ancestors have, that our ancestors developed, um, and realize that, you know, we can, we, you know, we're not doomed, you know, we're not in a nihilistic situation. We need to fight, you know, continually against racism and against oppression. But, you know, I think this book and everything African Americans have overcome shows that, you know, I think we can win. Do you see um, any examples today? Obviously, you know, 150, 168 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see examples today that remind you of those that you've come to know through this project? So, I mean, certainly, you know, Black Elite today uh, is involved in a lot of philanthropy, um, and a lot of the philanthropy is, you know, directed towards African Americans. You know, I went to Morehouse, you know, I have friends that were Oprah scholars at Morehouse. She sponsored, you know, students at Morehouse every year, which was something that Annie Malone did. Um, she used to sponsor one student at every historically black college in America. Mm. Um, you know, so that, you know, and Oprah is obviously very charitable, very giving. Um, I look at Magic Johnson and the way that he went into the African-American community and brought businesses. Uh, that's basically what Bob Church ended up doing in Memphis, you know, you know, creating Bill Streets, which is still, you know, a black, you know, black, you know, important site for black America today. Um, you know, so I am reminded, you know, through the philanthropy, we were just talking about Robert Smith. Uh, who gave a bunch of money to Cornell to sponsor scholarships for and, and you speak of Robert Smith, who now, according to Forbes, is the richest African American in the country. Yes. In, in the U.S. Yes, yes. Uh, hedge fund manager, mm -hmm. richest black man, you know, in the United States. Just uh, made a big gift to Cornell for scholarships um, for African Americans and women uh, who want to go into STEM. So, I mean, I, I do see the philanthropy, um, in it, you, but do I see anything on this level, if I had to be honest, um, not at this point. Um, and, you know, that's not, you know, meant to be a harsh critique. It's just these folks basically uh, redistributed their entire net worth and pre pretty much all of their power, you know, to the, Afri to the African American community uh, right after slavery to help us get established. So I don't think we're seeing anything on this magnitude. I mean, mm -hmm. you can argue whether or not that's needed or not. Um, but the there's nobody white who I think, you know, is really, you know, giving on this level um, either, to be clear about that. Um, they gave so much, you know, they gave almost everything, mm -hmm. you know, to help black folks get established after slavery. So you, you, you know, you, when you complete a masterpiece like this, something that, that, that is as special as this book is, what's next? So, I mean, I, I, my, what I'm trying to do is I really want to shine light you know, on the African-American story, um, especially immediately after slavery and how we built everything uh, that, 
we have, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So the next book is along the lines of this one. I'm not allowed to talk about it. Okay. Um, but the characters in the next book are in this book. I can say that much. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm working on the second book. Um, fortunate enough, Stephanie Elaine, the executive producer of Dear White People, um, is you know, turning the book into a television show, and I'm involved in that. Uh, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and, you know, still focused on, you know, trying to spread the word about, about this book. Lastly, um, you say you want to shine the light on slavery and, and, and that time period. We actually have one minute left. Why? Well, because I think the, the answers to, you know, the, the problems of the future um, may lie in the past. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things this book talks about is how the black economy was basically built by these people in this book and their contemporaries. Nobody really gave us anything. I mean, there were land grant universities, and some people, you know, were you know given jobs by the government or maybe a bit of land. But for the most part, Black uh, African Americans had to build everything we had ourselves. We had to build our own communities. We had to build our own businesses, our movements for civil rights and equal rights. We had to fund those. And so, I want us to take pride in the fact that not only did we do we have these things? Not only do we, did we have we fought for civil rights, but we were also the economic engine driving all of that. You know, I feel especially blessed, and hopefully our audience feels the same way, uh, to be very fortunate to have the guy who did Black Fortune sit here and talk to us. Thank you, man. Thank for you, Rocky. It was really an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. That wraps us for this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT. Go to WHUT.org, goodbye, and God bless, and good fortune. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.